Bowdoin, a small liberal arts college in Brunswick, Maine, is called home to almost 2,000 students. An institution of learning and hard work, Bowdoin prides itself in being a progressive place, especially when considering environmental issues. Supplies to everyone, life's worth living when nature's given happiness to everyone. So let's go. As a part of Bowdoin's long standing eco friendly traditions, in 2009, the college came together to officially organize and announce a plan to achieve carbon neutrality by 2020. Since the plan's creation, Students have expressed and shown off their support, but just how much do the students really know about the plan? Um, I know that they have a plan to become carbon neutral by 2020. I know nothing about it. Well, I don't know anything about the policy. Um, not much. I know it's a goal. Not very much. Yeah. I know absolutely nothing about that. I know that it exists. I know almost nothing about it. <laughs> I don't I don't even I didn't know there was a plan. Yeah. Support of the plan is ubiquitous around campus, but actual knowledge is a bit harder to find. Luckily, a few key figures are a bit less ignorant. Being a historian, let me give you a little bit of background on it. The carbon neutrality plan came out of student activism. It came out of two students who are both environmental studies majors, Meg Boyle and Kristen, uh, Catherine Kirkland. And they both wanted then-President Barry Mills to sign the president's climate commitment among college presidents uh, and university presidents. And then-President Mills said uh, he wasn't interested in signing it. He did not think it was in the college's financial interests. He did not think it was anything other than an empty gesture. So Catherine and Meg were a little bit dispirited, and they came back to the Environmental Studies Program and worked very closely with my friend and colleague, DeWitt John, who's the former director of the Environmental Studies Program and was also a professor in the Department of Government and Legal Studies. And together with other faculty, and I chimed in a very small amount, mostly Professor John and several of my other senior colleagues, they helped Meg and Catherine come up with a plan. And then they went back to President Mills, and he was so impressed with the scale of research and the depth of analysis that they brought to it that he decided to sign on to the President's climate commitment. And that is the beginning of Bowdoin's climate neutrality plan. I wanted to give that background because it is critical to underscore that none of this would have happened had there not been student activism to prod the administration. Despite Bowdoin's reliance on student involvement to reach its goal, in the nine years since the plan began, it has evidently become somewhat of a side note at the college, lingering on the periphery of campus life. Here's how things are looking today. So we set an original goal to reduce our own source emissions 28% by 2020, and we are currently on track to try to meet that goal. Um, it's, we, in the last fiscal year, fiscal year 2016, we, um, we have continued to make progress. We realize we have a fair amount to go to reach that 28%. So the ultimate question lingers, will Bowdoin be carbon neutral by 2020? That's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion right now trying to decide what we want to do. Um, and I don't have an answer for that right now. I don't have an answer for that right now. I don't have an answer for that right now. With the impending deadline of 2020, Bowdoin has come to realize that achieving carbon neutrality on their own may not be feasible. As a result, they have turned to some controversial methods of reduction. One of the biggest ways that Bowdoin plans to achieve their plan is by purchasing Renewable Energy Credits, or RECs. Instead of cutting down carbon emissions within the college, RECs allow Bowdoin to pay for someone else's reductions in places off campus and away. 
obviously to be legitimately carbon neutral would be superior to this buying credits um, to supplement but I think that buying credits to supplement is better than not buying credits to supplement because at least you're doing something so if it is completely unachievable to become carbon neutral which due to infrastructure it probably is or like like incredibly difficult then I think it is better than to not do it I kind of worry that carbon credits can disincentivize or kind of push off the creation of larger uh, renewable resource infrastructure or developments and um, can kind of push away the problem instead of really putting the onus on people in larger, uh, larger changes. Students may not be so fond of the college buying its way out of this commitment, but without Rex, Bowdoin might not meet its deadline and the struggle to reduce could go on indefinitely. I think there's certainly a place for renewable energy credits. Um, you know, whether Bowdoin decides to go that route or not is, um, is not up to me, but I think um, in general, if you get to a point where the cost of trying to reduce your emissions becomes so prohibitive, then um, purchasing RECs that is incentivizing additional renewable energy on the grid is can be a positive thing. So are wrecks ideal? No. Dams have all sorts of problems. They kill fish. They increase water temperature. They uh, derange the uh, hydraulics of a river system. But comparatively, if you're going to achieve the commitment, then I don't think you're going to be able to avoid using wrecks. Wrecks might not give Bowdoin students the storybook ending that they desire. In 2020, they won't be able to say that their campus is authentically carbon neutral. However, this is not the point. We share one world. Whether it be on the campus of a prestigious liberal arts college in Brunswick, or a dam further down the Androscoggin, or a solar farm in rural Maine, it all has the same result. It will lower carbon emissions on a global level effectively fighting against climate change and making the planet a better place. Wrecks are not picturesque, but they will get the job done. Well, the, the, the real sad and blunt fact of the matter is the vast majority of people that attend school here probably are not going to see the results of not cutting back on their consumption or not cutting back on um, their contribution to uh, climate change. Uh, most people that live in the developed world, most people that are likely attending a place such as Bowdoin are likely going to be insulated from that. So I don't think they'll actually directly see that. I think what will happen is that they may see it later in their lifetime. Depending on where they live, they may see it more dramatically than uh, other people. And I think it will fall to what future generations will see. Uh, climate change is not unfolding evenly across the planet and it will not continue to unfold evenly in the years and decades ahead. The Bowdoin bubble is a happy place for the most part. The students are joyous and hopeful with bright futures ahead of them. It's meant to be the best four years of their lives, so for the time being, they are safe from all the world's dangers. They don't need to worry where their trash goes, where the food comes from, what heats the campus, or gives them light at the flip of a switch. But everything has a story. It all comes from somewhere and affects someone. Usually someone less privileged in a place far away from Brunswick. Given their location and situation, it is no surprise that students don't feel the immediate effects of environmental issues. They don't see the problem because they don't see the consequences. And because they don't see the consequences, they let the plan become invisible hidden behind a cloud of bliss as others endure the results. That's why I care about it. The environment, I have no idea what the hell the environment is beyond some large concept. 
but people, places, things, relationships, those are the things that matter.